thank you all for being here today. Thank you to the, the McHale family, to the Thank you for giving me the opportunity to having to raise a microphone. That pretty much never happens. <laughs> Thank you to the Maurice and Ramsey Memorial Lecture Series. What an extraordinary opportunity this is to hear from the next generation such extraordinary knowledge. And this, is, this isn't good, right? It's fine. I'm hearing something. Right. You're not hearing it. Okay, that's fine. It's an extraordinary opportunity, and I'm incredibly grateful for the chance to, to be here with you to share this. The, the centrality of families, you know, certainly in the Middle East, everywhere, of course, people talk of families, but in Middle Eastern culture, you see how families emerge and how family remains the root of political mobilization, of poetry, of art, of everything. And so seeing that coming to life here with, how many of you are part of the family? Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot of people from one family. And then I know the rest of you are like part of the family anyway. So I'm, I'm, I'm moved extraordinarily much to, to be part of this and to, to join you today. Knowing that I am Standing on the shoulders of my great mentor, Noam Chomsky, is always a terrifying thought. And of course, when somebody has said, and the first one was Noam Chomsky, and I remember it all from age eight, that's even more um, intimidating. Thank you very much, Tess. Um, but I will say that there is something about how history moves forward in this country that particularly when we look at US policy in a place like the Middle East, the title Wars or Peace in the Middle East could pretty much be an, you know, a useful, up-to-date, moment-to-moment title going back about 75 years. So what I'm actually gonna do is be a little disappointing, perhaps, um, to those of you who were expecting it to be what I said it was gonna be, because I kind of changed what I was thinking I would talk about today. So instead of talking about the specifics of the war against ISIS, the, the Turkish intervention in Syria, the question of the Kurds, Palestine, Israel, what's going on in Yemen, which is disastrous, I thought I would take a step back and look more broadly at the US policy questions involving war and militarism, particularly in the greater Middle East region, but from the vantage point of why is it that war and militarism are such intense, consistent components of our world? That when we talk and joke about being terrified when we look at the news, it's not a joke. And why is that? Certainly there are other issues that are not directly related to, to war and militarism, issues of economic inequality, the climate, the climate, and the urgency of what is happening now. I've spent several of the last several weeks with Jane Fonda and others in Washington in these uh, fire drill Friday mobilizations, teach-ins Thursday night and rallies and civil disobedience Friday mornings that are looking at the question of climate as the urgency of today, the urgency of, of now, but linked to the other issues that are so crucial and that crucially movements exist. So linking climate with the women's movement, climate and the right to water, climate and protection of the oceans. Last week it was climate and war. And it's an extraordinary thing because what you see is the urgency of the question of the climate. Will we survive as a species? The planet will survive, we know that. But whether the planet will be able to, to support people remains a very open question. So there's a very particular urgency because of the universality of that. But you can't talk, as we know, even about climate without talking about these other questions. So when we talk about US foreign policy, what we see is that US foreign policy, and let's say for the last 50 years, maybe 75 years, 
has always been based on war. There were always different excuses for it. We need to be mobilized against the Cold War so the Cold War doesn't get any hotter. Well, the Cold War was hot enough in lots of places in the world. It wasn't so hot inside the United States and inside the Soviet Union. But lots of other places were very, very hot. Just ask the people of Central America, of Angola, of Mozambique, of Vietnam. These were all products of a not very cold Cold War. The period of the brief period where the US was designated the sole superpower. We still had to have war at the core of our foreign policy because you never knew when somebody might try to say, we don't want you to be the sole superpower. And of course now, since 9-11, we've had what's known as the GWAT, my personal favorite Washington acronym because it sounds so much like what it is, something very evil, the Global War on Terror. That was George Bush's name. Now, President Obama, when he came into office, one of the first things he did was to send out a memo saying, you know, we really don't think we want to use this term, the global war on terror. It sounds very negative. So we would actually prefer, and this was sent to pretty much everybody in the federal government, it wasn't a mandatory thing, but it was a request that instead of calling it the global war on terror, that we call it overseas contingency operations. Now, that's a kind of benign, nice name, but to me, that's kind of what you'd say about rescuing global kittens in a global tree, you know? This is, this is what you talk about when you talk about sending the Navy out to pick up survivors of, of a hurricane somewhere. That's a, an instant, immediate operation somewhere. These are wars we're talking about. There's nothing contingent about them, except for the fact that they're not required. They are wars of choice. And wars of choice have been the choice of president after president after president after Congress after Congress after Congress. And permanent war has become what our wars look like today. So when we remember what Dr. Martin Luther King taught us at his extraordinary speech at Riverside Church in 1967, when he talked about the evil triplets of racism, poverty, and militarism. And today we would, as the Poor People's Campaign has reminded us, we would have to include climate. When we talk about those four evil things, it is still relevant to look at those four things as the, the key targets of our mobilizations. And I think that speaking as we heard from Tessa a few minutes ago, this being Indigenous Peoples Month, it is particularly apt, although it's always important, it's always necessary to remind ourselves at all times what the legacy of this country has been. And it's something that we learned in a very important context from the great historian Howard Zinn, who taught us that the history of US power, economic power, global military power, strategic power, all kinds of power, is rooted in the two evils of genocide and slavery. Genocide against the indigenous people of this land and slavery that brought Africans in chains to this country to steal their labor, to steal their personhood, to force them into slavery. And Howard taught us something else, which has to also be part of how we approach these devastating questions. And that is for as long as there has been genocide and slavery in this country, there have also been movements against genocide and slavery. And that's the legacy that we stand on today. Those are the, the shoulders that we stand on today as we build movements against racism, movements for immigrant rights, movements to protect the climate, movements to protect science. Whoever thought you'd need a movement to protect science? But that is our reality today. And we know when we talk about this question of militarism being at the root of racism, being at the root of genocide and slavery, because without militarism, those ideas would have just been evil ideas. They wouldn't have been able to be, they wouldn't have been able to be put into practice. We also know that they're not new, that they were part of our origins, but they're also, they were never secret. 
it was never a secret that, that militarism was so fundamental to this country and how it operates. From General Eisenhower, when he was president, he said, every gun that is made, every warship that is launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. He was hardly a peacenik, General Eisenhower, but he understood the totality of the control of militarism in this country. It was, it was in a very similar moment that he spoke of the military-industrial conflict. And that military-industrial collaboration is still what determines so much of what our foreign policy looks like. So the wars continue. Today, in the, in, the, in the areas that we're talking about, the war in Yemen, which isn't a war between Yemen and somewhere else, it's a war within Yemen that has, is being fought to the last Yemeni, where now the United Nations has determined that it is the war in Yemen. When you look at the humanitarian disaster that is the aftermath of the Syrian war, to say, as the UN has said for the last four years, that the worst humanitarian disaster in the world today is Yemen, a country that most people in this country can't even find on a map because it never had anything really connected to our understanding of our role in the world. Although we should not forget what's known in the United Nations as the Yemen precedent something that happened around the earlier war in Iraq in 1990, when the US at that time, they thought it was a good idea, maybe even a necessity, to get UN approval to go to war against Iraq, something that George Bush II failed to do in 2003 when he went to war against Iraq. But his father understood the importance of getting credibility of some sort from the United Nations, legality if not legitimacy. They were determined to get the approval of the Security Council to go to war against Iraq. And there was only one Arab country on the council. It was Yemen, which had just recently, only months before, been reunified after a long period of separation between North and South Yemen. And the Yemeni government knew that as the only, Yemen, as the only Arab country on the council, there was no way they could embrace and endorse a US invasion of Kuwait and an inevitable invasion of Iraq that would follow. So when the vote happened, the Yemeni ambassador voted no. And no sooner had he put down his hand, Abdullah al ashtab no sooner had he brought his hand down that the US ambassador was at his side saying, that will be the most important no vote you ever cast. And sure enough, three days later, the US cut its entire aid budget to Yemen. Then, as now, the poorest country in the Arab world. Now, US aid to Yemen at that moment was nothing. It was a pittance, it was $70 million, which is, in global terms, chump change. But it wasn't about Yemen. It was about sending a message to everybody else. You cross us on an issue that is important to us, and you will pay a price. And today, at the UN, if you talk to people who were there in 1990, as I was, they will speak of the Yemen precedent and say, it still remains, it still remains. But the war, of course, is not only in Yemen. The wars are, are continuing in, in Syria, in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, where there are still 13,000 troops in the country. Last month, we just got another report from the United Nations indicating that more civilians than ever have been killed. And the vast majority of civilians that are killed are killed by airstrikes. Now, who has airstrikes in Afghanistan? It's not the Taliban. They don't have any planes. They don't have drones, they're not sending bombers. It's our planes. We are the ones, the US-led coalition. Some operating in the name of the Afghan government, others operating in the name of the Pentagon. It's our planes, our bombs, our pilots who are killing civilians in Afghanistan. And in Syria, we know there are still 800 at least US soldiers in Syria. They're not even claiming that they're supporting or protecting Kurdish lives. They're now officially there because of the oil. Syria isn't even a major oil producer. The US doesn't need any oil from that region. It's producing 
enough that it doesn't even import from that region anymore, hardly at all. So this isn't about protecting our great need for oil. This is about another excuse to keep soldiers based in Syria. And for businessman in chief, saying it's about oil seems to be the way that he thinks there will be credibility for that. So we have a t occasionally a moment where attention is paid. Attention was paid somewhat astonishingly last month, two months ago now, when Trump announced that he was going to withdraw troops from Syria, knowing that the inevitable result, the green light he was giving to the Turkish government to reinvade into Syrian territory, to target those who the Turkish government had said from the beginning was their real enemy, more than ISIS. They wanted the excuse to go after the Kurds, as they have so many times before. Now, to anyone who knows US history with the Kurds, this was hardly a surprise. The US history has always been one of embrace and abandon, embrace and abandon. George Bush the first, you remember, told the people of Iraq to rise up against their dictatorship and the US will have your back. Well, a bunch of Kurds did just that. And the US said, bye-bye, you're on your own. And Kurds were slaughtered in huge numbers. They weren't the only ones, but they were among those. And we know that the response, that extraordinary humanitarian human response that we saw from so many people in this country who were suddenly worried about what was going to happen to the Kurds wasn't because the US was betraying the Kurds. The US has betrayed an awful lot of peoples over the world, over the years. It has betrayed the Afghans who had said, we're here to liberate you and we continue to kill civilians. You know, we continue to create a situation where at the time that the US took over in Afghanistan in 2001, three weeks after 9-11, saying this was a war for justice, not admitting it was a war for vengeance. At that time when the, the Taliban ruled in Afghanistan and conditions of life for women were horrific, Afghanistan was the worst country in the world for a child to be born and survive to her first birthday. Today, after almost 20 years of US military occupation, Afghanistan is still the worst country in the world for a child to be born and survive to her first birthday. This is what we bring as our gift, our gift of militarism. So we know that it was somewhat unexpected to have that level of, of popular uprising almost, of outrage. How can you do this to our allies? But that was the key. This was not a problem that people were having sufficiently with the fact that there was a military attack going on, but that it was against people who had just a day earlier been our guys, been our allies. That's what people were reacting to, which is appropriate. It's appropriate. But what does it say about our willingness to accept the constant militarization of our policy, not only in the Middle East, throughout Africa, throughout so much else of the world, when we don't see that rising up? A lot of it has to do with the nature of the wars, not the facts of the wars, not the fact that we are still killing civilians in huge numbers in so many places around the world. You know, that we have, I'm not sure if I remember all the numbers, but I remember that there are special forces, US special forces operating in 49 countries today. US troops are stationed in 175 countries and we have military bases in 800 places around the world, 800 military bases outside of our own borders. And we're not seeing that kind of outrage on a daily basis about all of that, even though people are still being killed. And why is that? Because the nature of these wars has changed. We no longer are sending hundreds of thousands of US troops, which inevitably, of course, leads to troops coming back in the tens and then the hundreds and eventually the thousands of body bags. We are not seeing US casualties. We are not seeing Americans captured. Now that's good. There should not be people shot down and kidnapped. But there should not be Afghans and Syrians and Kurds and so many others 
being killed by our policies either. And the problem we face is that people don't know that's going on. We know it when we read something on page A17 of the newspaper about four people, four US special forces guys were killed in Niger. And people start saying, Niger? What is that? Is that like Nigeria? Oh, it's different? Oh, okay, Niger. We have troops in Niger? What are they doing there? It's the only time anybody knew that we have troops in Niger. We have had troops in Niger for a very long time. We're not doing much to help the people of Niger. But we only hear about it when it's people from our country who are the victims. So as the wars, and this happened mainly under President Obama, as the wars turn away from ground troops and turn more towards drone strikes and airstrikes and special forces and assassinations, we hear less and less about it. It doesn't touch us. We're less likely to know anyone in harm's way. And I think that's a serious challenge that we face. In the context of that, it makes it even more shocking, not surprising certainly, but shocking that the military budget continues to rise and rise and rise and rise again. The military budget this year is $716 billion. Now that's one of those numbers, it's so big that it's like, nobody here, is anybody here a math major or a mathematician? Ooh, okay, you might know what it means, but I'm guessing that pretty much nobody else does. Because it's, you know, it's one of those numbers, you could say a gazillion dollars and it would mean the same thing. But it's a ton of money. It's a ton of money. Next year, the military budget is going to be $750 billion a year. This year already, we spent more on the military than the next seven countries combined. And that's including China and Russia, the biggest spenders. We could cut half the military budget. We could cut out $350 billion from the military budget. We would still be spending more than China and Russia and Iran and North Korea combined if we cut the military budget in half. So that's what we're, what we're looking at. Budgets are our moral center. Budgets show us our morality or our immorality. And for those who say, well, no one wants war, you've got to stop them and say, sorry, you're wrong. Not very many people want war, but the ones who do have a very good reason for wanting more. They're making a killing on the killing. Why is it that the military budget is so high? You know, why is it that members of Congress will vote for weapon systems like the F-35 fighter this, this jet that the Pentagon doesn't want that has blown up in tests on the, on the tarmac and has cost literally billions. And the Pentagon keeps saying, we don't want it, we can't use it. And Congress says, we're going to give it to you anyway. Why is that? It's not because they're stupid. It's because they rely on funding. And they rely on the fact that the production of military stuff, unlike things like, you know, cars, is designed so that it's made all over the country, right? So that every congressional district is producing some little widget that is then going to be sent across the country to some other factory in another congressional district that's going to attach it to some other little widget, who are then going to send it back across to the other side of the country, using up huge amounts of fossil fuel in the meantime. It's the least effective, least efficient way of building things, right? The most efficient way is what they call vertical production. You do everything in one place. So you're not wasting time, you're not wasting fuel, you're not wasting whatever, sending stuff from here to there and back again. Only military stuff is routinely produced in the least efficient way possible to ensure that no member of Congress is gonna be willing to say, we, I'm gonna vote against the F-35 because somebody in some factory has a job there in their district. Maybe it's 10 people in some little widget company. Maybe it's 6,000 people in Boeing. You know, whatever it is, they're not going to be willing to look like they're giving up jobs. And they don't have the plans yet for creating new jobs that are not based on the military, like all those people that are working on a 
on a, on a line that's producing the widgets that make the F-35, they could produce the widgets that produce solar panels instead. You know, we're still gonna need a lot of production. So when we look at these moral priorities that are so clear, and the other side, just, just one other note on this, when you hear the, the answer, which you will, whenever you say we should cut the military budget, we can't do that to the troops. We can't betray the troops. Remind people, remind people that half of our entire military budget doesn't go to the troops. It goes to military corporations producing stuff and their CEOs, the top five military companies, their CEOs average $20 million salaries. And in the meantime, 23,000 active duty soldiers qualify for food stamps because their salaries are so low. You do the math, you do the math. That's what we're dealing with when we talk about this conflict between the moral reality that our budget shows us and what we claim to believe in, what we claim to represent. So when we talk about why is this happening, particularly in the Middle East, it's again, it's a place where the, the, the rules haven't changed. You know, the, the three pillars of US policy in the region have been pretty much the same for a long time, those strategic goals since World War II, oil, Israel, and, st and stability. The problem is you can't usually have all three of them at one time. And what defines them changes a lot. So oil is, you know, oil is still a very big deal. There's changes now in, afoot because less oil is being finally is, is starting to be used because people understand its role in climate change. There's, there's issues around uh, the changing levels of, of US imports. The US doesn't rely very much on imported oil anymore because of fracking. For God's sakes, they're now destroying our own country instead of other countries to get the oil so that we don't need to bring it in from other places. The question of Israel is changing dramatically in the public's understanding. You know, the issue for Israel was always that there were two reasons for the close relationship between the US and Israel. One was political and one was strategic. So the strategic in interest is really how it started. You know, when, when Israel was first created, the US was not its strongest ally. It didn't get its weapons from the US. It got them from Czechoslovakia and from France primarily. The US recognized Israel early on, had a good relationship, but it wasn't what we now call this, quote, special relationship. That didn't start until 1967, after the Six Day War, when the Pentagon, not the State Department, the Pentagon looked at Israel and said, wow, these guys are good. We could do business with these people. And business, military business, became the operative component of the strategic ties between the US and Israel. The other side, besides the strategic, is the political. And that's where you see the set of pro-Israel lobbies. And there's a bunch of them. Some are rooted primarily in the Jewish community. Some are rooted primarily in the evangelical Christian community. But there's a lot. And whenever one, whenever the strategic side would diminish a bit, like at the end of the Cold War, when suddenly Israel's value as a cat's paw of US interests around the world started to diminish, that's when suddenly the, the political side, the lobbies, kicked into high gear and they became much more influential. When the global war on terror began, suddenly Israel was once again at the center of, of strategic planning. At that point, that was when the lobby sort of disappeared, it didn't disappear, that's the wrong word, it diminished in its influence and its actions because it wasn't needed as much. The relationship was now gonna be based again on the strategic side. So that's the basis when Bibi Netanyahu, who like now was the prime minister of Israel at the time of the 9-11 attacks, some of you may remember, a few of you weren't around then, but some of you will remember that when he was told about what had just happened in New York with the, the destruction, the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, his instinctive first answer was, that's good. And then he caught himself and realized he was on an open mic and that was not a good thing to say. So he said, well, it's not good, but now they will know how it feels. So it was that sense of, it's still all about us. And now we can use this to consolidate our relationship even more closely, which is precisely what happened. And then on the question of strategic stability, now that has changed a lot. That includes markets, selling US goods, selling a lot of US arms, that's where a lot of the arms go, places like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Jordan, Egypt. The poorer countries, the US 
gives them military aid to buy the arms, and they buy our arms. The richer countries, like the Gulfies, the U.S. simply sells them arms with their money. But either way, the money comes straight back to U.S. military corporations, who are making a killing on the wars. So again, this notion of who wants war is the people who are making a killing, carrying out the wars. The strategic side, though, also has another side. You know, some of, we, some of you will remember when the war in Iraq began, there was a lot of talk about this is a war for oil. And it was a big slogan of the anti-war movement, stop the war for oil. The reality was it was never only about Israel. I'm sorry, it was, only, it was never only about oil. It was partly about oil. It was partly about Israel in terms of political reasons. But it was also about the expansion of US power in the region. Because if you look at a map, I didn't bring a map with me. Probably should have, but you all know where the UN. <laughs> Why am I talking like this today? I'm not talking about the United Nations. I will in a minute. When you look at the U.S. presence in the Middle East, what do you see there? You see the capacity to expand military force, meaning to attack Africa, the rest of the Arab world, the rest of Europe, and all of Asia. You're right in the thick of things. So that notion of the reasons for war in Iraq, yes, had a lot to do with oil, but it also had a lot to do with that expansion of power. It's the reason we establish bases all over the place, bases that they talk about as, as lily pads. Imagine a frog jumping from one lily pad to the next. That's the idea, is that you can have troops moving from one place to another, and then strike from there, and then move back to another lily pad. It's this very anodyne, uh, vision of what U.S. military bases are for, right? They're like lilies, right? They're like lilies in the pond. And it's like, well, actually not so much. So the strategies, of course, differ all over the region and all over the world, of course, but in the region we're talking about today, from direct overthrow of governments, military occupation, uh, invasion, imposing U.S.-backed governments, funding governments that are repressive in, in their own right, arms sales, denying arms sales, all those, all those things, become the basis for what the US goals, how the US goals are going to be implemented. So when we hear from the president, as we did just a week or two ago, I'm ending these endless wars, a lot of people are so desperate to end those wars that they sit back and say, wow, that's fabulous. And frankly, if it were true, it would be. Whoever did it, it would be great. But that's not what's happening. We are hearing a fake claim to be ending the wars. I think Trump, who I should say, unlike every president before, who was accountable to kind of US, the consensus of US ruling circles, Donald Trump is not, in my view. He is absolutely not accountable to what has long been the US goal of being the dominant power in the world. I'm not saying that it's such an, a benign goal that was the consensus goal of, of politicians in DC, but it has been a consensus for a really long time. And every single president, in different ways, there's different wings of it and different opinions, but it's within that broad tent. Every president has always been accountable to that, until now. So that's why when we hear President Trump say, I'm going to pull the troops out of Afghanistan. The first instinct is to say, well, finally, because it's certainly not making life any better for the Afghans. And then you step back another step and say, well, wait a minute, is he actually doing that? And it turns out, no, actually, there's about 1,000 troops more in Afghanistan now than there were when he took office. And he shows no sign that he's pulling them out. He talks a lot about ending these wars because he knows that people in his base don't want these wars to go forward. They don't want the wars to go forward. And that's true. They don't. A lot of other people don't either. And it's also true that people in Trump's base come from areas, particularly in rural areas, with the higher than average percentage of people that go into the military. Because our military today is not the so-called all-volunteer force we like to talk about. There is no longer a legal draft. But to say that the people who go into the military are doing it by choice really denies the reality of the poverty draft, 
the draft of no way to go to school. I know two young soldiers who joined the military because they could not get health care for their families any other way. So we're not exactly looking at a volunteer army. Certainly there are, there are people, particularly after 9-11 we saw this, who joined the military out of a sense of patriotism and they wanted to protect their country. That's absolutely true. It's also absolutely true that that's not the majority of people that are now in the military. And so when we look at how does that play out, how does that global war on, on terrorism play out with all those people that are in the military for reasons that don't make any sense? This is what explains the high level of casualties among soldiers and sailors and air people that are coming back from their deployments. The reason why so many more people than in earlier wars are coming back not only with grievous injuries, that part is the good news that in earlier wars they would have died on the battlefield. They would not have survived. Now they survive, but they also come back with the most horrific mental and emotional damage. The moral injury is the term that's now being used more and more. Why didn't we see this in earlier wars? We did, but not in the numbers, not in the percentages we see it now. It's because people are seeing through these illusions that these are wars that are somehow making things better for people in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria or wherever, and that it's keeping us safer. They go and they see that that's not true, that they are not being welcomed with rice and flowers as liberators on the street, but they are being attacked as inter interlopers, interferers, invaders. And that's what we're dealing with today. When we hear that this year, in, in 2019, that again, like last year, the majority of the civilian deaths come from airstrikes, and we know who can carry out airstrikes and who can't. And we know that 41% of the civilian casualties in Afghanistan are women and children. They're not battlefield soldiers. They're not even accused of being terrorists. If they were males, whoever they were, they would be accused of being terrorists, because that's how the U US military does things. But these are women and kids who nobody claims are terrorists. They're collateral damage. And there are more of them than ever before. So when we hear about the, the willingness to send troops, and then we're going to withdraw the troops, but then we send them again, it's this lack of ideological clarity, a lack of a strategy that we're that we're dealing with, with this, with this president. And one of the things that's made it so particularly dangerous right now is the question of how the US is dealing with Iran. Iran has become the centerpiece of all of US strategy in the Middle East. It's the basis for our relationship with Saudi Arabia and the UAE. It's the reason that nobody was willing to implement the congressional decision to cut arms sales to Saudi Arabia because they are being used to slaughter Yemeni civilians, and they were not willing to do it after the killing, the brutal killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Why weren't they willing to? The Congress was finally, was finally committed. Both houses voted, and Trump vetoed all four resolutions. Now why? Why, why would he do that? It has to do with his own understanding of his great relationship through his son-in-law. This is a, a movement of crown princes. You know, We have Jared Kushner, we have Mohammed bin Salman, and we have the crown prince in the UAE, the three of them, the three crown princes, coming together to create this new Middle East with the US as the, the central component to it, all focused on be, building a movement, a militarized mobilization in the region against Iran. Iran provides the excuse for greater militarization every year. And the danger is, Iran is not some pushover country that you can just kind of use it as a symbol and nothing really happens. One of the tragedies of the US abandonment of the Iran nuclear deal was not just that it was international law and had been secured by the Security Council of the United Nations. It was, a, it was a, an agreement by six US allies as, as well as Iran itself, the entire European Union. This was like a huge accomplishment. It's not only that, it's not only all that. It's also that it was working. 
It was working. Iran had given up 98% of its stockpiled uranium. It never had weapon-grade uranium anyway, but it gave up 98% of the low enriched uranium that it did have. It was working better than any other anti-nuclear agreement had ever worked. And that's the one that we give up, right? So what's happening now? We're hearing that Iran is going back to enriching uranium. They keep doing it, thankfully, one tiny step at a time, begging the Europeans and the Russians and the Chinese to do something to, to bring the US to heel or to say, all right, we're gonna do it without the US. We're gonna somehow get you the money that's being lost by US sanctions that's having a huge negative impact on the population in Iran, but of course is doing nothing to change government behavior because things don't work that way. Didn't work that way in Iraq, hasn't worked that way in Cuba, doesn't work that way anywhere, mm -hmm. that the US is trying to use state-sponsored sanctions for this sort of pressure. It just doesn't work. It works against the population. So the US is essentially already at war with Iran. It's not a shooting war, luckily. But we are so close to that moment. The, the Persian Gulf, if you look at it, is this narrow little strip of, of water, right? It is so filled with warships right now. There's two US carrier groups. US aircraft carriers, are they're so big. They are as long as three football fields. And they are 20 stories high and they hold 7,000 troops. They're surrounded by 50 other warships, right? Smaller ones, bigger ones and smaller ones, but not like that. So they're surrounded, by, it's like a whole city, right? There's two carrier groups in, in, belonging to the US in the Persian Gulf. The Iranians have a bunch of little speedboats, armed little speedboats that are much more flexible, much more agile, that are sailing around. And imagine what happens late one night Somebody, some young sailor on deck of either side sees a, a flare, a flash of light, and says, oh my God, we're under attack. I've got to respond. If that happened in, in Syria and it was an American troop or a Russian troop, they have a military to military hotline. They could just call and say, calm down. This was a mistake. Nobody's, nobody's flying anywhere. Nobody's flying around. Nobody's sending any bombs. Call back your troops. It's like, okay, whew, we were safe. They don't have anything like that. So that young soldier, that young sailor would have to go to her commander who would have to call somebody in Washington <clears throat> at the State Department who would then have to call the Swiss embassy in Tehran, wake up the Swiss ambassador, because it's remember it's the middle of the night when they saw the flare, and say, yikes, there's something gonna happen. Go, go tell somebody at the, at the Iranian defense ministry to hold off. So, okay, well, how long is that gonna take exactly? You know? The danger of a so-called accidental war, which will not be accidental at all, is a very real threat. So this threat of war, in, in the sense of a shooting war, is far graver than it has been for a very long time. And what that means is we need diplomacy instead of war. That's been our, our call all along. It, it, still is, it's a sense of recognizing the dangers that our policy has brought about. Our policies, our foreign policies are supposed to be in US interests. They're supposed to be there to make us not only safer, but to build friends around the world, right? Instead, our policies are building hate. And unfortunately, when hate gets on steroids, we know what it can lead to. And the people that don't hate us fear us. I don't think either hate or fear is the kind of role that we want to be playing in the world. So this is a moment for new ideas. You know, after the 2018 election, we saw a new crop of progressive young people of color, mainly women, coming into the Congress with really amazing new ideas, big ideas, bold ideas, saying, I'm not just here to kind of keep them on track. I'm here to say we want big change. We don't just want to tinker around the edges of Obamacare. We want Medicare for all. We're not just going to tinker around the edges of you know, lowering the, the amount of oil that we use. We want a Green New Deal that's going to change everything. These are huge, big ideas. And it always comes back to, well, that's all good. How are you going to pay for it? Well, 
a big part of the answer is we're going to cut the military budget. The Green New Deal, the Green New Deal has to have an anti-militarist component. Because if you can cut $350 billion out of the military budget, that's going to cover a whole bunch of the Green New Deal. If you add to that the $880 billion that my colleagues at IPS have figured out is what you could get from a very tiny tax on the richest, and you add that to the $350 billion, you could pretty much cover the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. That's not chump change. That's real stuff. Now, look at how, look at how that works. In Toledo this year, all of you are Toledo taxpayers almost, Toledo taxpayers are paying $268 million in taxes for the military budget. $268 million. Now again, that's one of those numbers, you know, what the hell does it mean? How, what's $268 million? Well, I'll tell you what it is. You could use that same amount of money for 31,694 kids getting into Head Start. Or you could use it to create 4,829 infrastructure jobs. You could provide health care to 58,876 people. Or you could build solar power transformation in 443,343 houses. What's going to make us safer? That's the question we need people all over the country to be asking. Does it make it safer for us to be maintaining 800 military bases around the world? and have special forces carrying out assassinations in 49 countries? This is, the, this is the challenge that we have today. Militarism is linked to the problems that Martin Luther King taught us about more than 50 years ago. Militarism is linked to racism and poverty and the degradation of the climate. Militarism comes home. Why do we have the rise in Islamophobia that we've been seeing these last years. Islamophobia is an old story. It's not something new and different. But why do we have this escalation? It's because if you build up hatred for Muslims at home, it makes it a whole lot easier to justify killing Muslims abroad. And in an era which we're in now, where most of the targets of most of our wars are mostly Muslim, that's a big help. That's a big help to the Pentagon. That makes it a lot easier. It makes it easier to convince young men and women in the military to go after these people they have never met before, have never seen before, and know nothing about if they can say, well, you know, they're like those bad guy Muslims that are trying to invade our borders. That's why these things are linked. The struggle against racism, the struggle against Islamophobia, all of these things come together. The struggle against anti-Semitism, all of them have to be linked to building an end to war. At the end of the day, and I want to end with this, I think we have to remember both things that Howard Zinn taught us. The origins of our country in genocide and slavery and know the role that militarism from the beginning has played in that and the movements against militarism, the, the movements against genocide and slavery that have been part of our country's history. We stand on the shoulders of those who fought against genocide. It, there weren't many of them, but there were some. Those who fought against slavery, there were more of them, and it was one. Those who fought for women's rights, those who fought against Jim Crow segregation, those who fought against the war in Vietnam, and yes, those who fought for the climate, we stand on all of their shoulders when we talk about endless wars in the Middle East. It becomes our job to figure out how to end them. We have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Questions and this mic is mobile. Okay, we quickly got questions. Um, I will just, yeah, well, I'll introduce this. Is there another mic?
Ishmael Gad. I'm a Muslim American, originally from parents originally from Egypt. Um, I really like the quote that we started off with by uh, speaking about how we should have pessimism in our intellects. And um, I think towards the end of your your talk, you were talking about how we have new ideas and uh, a new approach that we can go about. Um, sometimes, you know, I'm an engineer from an engineering background. Sometimes we innovate ourselves into new problems. I mean, there's this whole new movement with you know, the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, that there's this brave new world that we were entering, that we're gonna leave the Dark Ages, we're gonna leave behind you know, the Crusaders' invasion, which is very similar to invasions that we see in the Middle East now. Um, how are things gonna be different? I mean, is there gonna be a new monster that we're gonna create out of these new ideas? Um, so. Wow, that's a huge question. It's, it's in some ways, Gramsci is the appropriate focus because it's a, it's a question of philosophy. Um, I think when we are faced with the reality of today's monsters and the monstrousness of those monsters is felt far more around the world than they are in this country, despite the vast gap between wealth and poverty, the inequality of this country, I think that we do have to take responsibility for changing those monsters, for challenging those monsters. Will other monsters rise? Certainly possible. I'm not much of a believer in, in uh, nirvana as something that just sort of happens and everything's gonna be wonderful. But I think if we could cut the military budget and stop the distortion of our economy that that causes, and at the same time use that money for things, for social uplift, as Dr. King used that language, for things like a Green New Deal, Medicare for All, and to eliminate this vast gap between wealth and poverty, uh, that would be huge. Those would be huge monsters to get rid of. Would other monsters rise? Undoubtedly. And three generations from now, we will see new people fighting new monsters, hopefully with new bold ideas and without weapons. But I think we have to fight the monsters that face us. And today, those monsters are racism and poverty and militarism and the destruction of the climate. Much respect and appreciation for your work in the world. I just have one question. I just want to know who among, what the percentage of Congress members is that become board members for such entities as Lockheed Martin, et cetera? Very good question. I don't have the numbers in my head. Um, I think that what's even more important than that is looking at members of Congress who today are voting for military budget items that they know are unnecessary, don't keep us safe, don't even work in some cases, because they have, they, they fear being accused of being responsible for losing jobs in their districts. And what they don't know are things like the proportion of, uh, that's not the right word, it's not the proportion, it's military jobs, I should never talk about numbers, I always get it wrong, but I do know this part. If you invest a certain amount of money in military jobs, you'll get, say, 50 jobs. If you invest the same amount of money in healthcare jobs, it's way more than 50 for the same amount of money. If, it, if you invest it in infrastructure jobs, it's even more. So the notion that maintaining a military-based economy is what's necessary for our country, you just have to do the math. Not like me, but somebody who actually knows math, like you. Uh, somebody has to do the math. People in my office know how to do the math better than me, thankfully. And you can look at the National Priorities Project, na nationalpriorities.org, that has a whole lot of the facts and figures around this, including the stuff about Toledo, uh, that will tell you all those questions. Your question is a very good one, and I'm sure there's research out there on how many members of Congress every year go off to join the boards of military corporations. And it's a good challenge for me to find that out and start learning that number. So thank you. There's a mic coming. Since we're on Congress, presidents come and go every four or eight years, but congressmen and senators can be there for generations. Do you think that needs to change? And then another question on war. 
the war on polio in Afghanistan. Do you have any knowledge or comment about that? Sure. Um, the first one on, uh, I, I don't really, I'm not an expert in sort of electoral stuff like that, so I don't really have an opinion about whether uh, some kind of, um, I, I'm forgetting the term, term, term limits, term limits, you all know, whether term limits for Congress would make sense. I, I don't really have an opinion, I'm not sure. I think what is true is that the level of accountability of electing members of the House is significantly greater than senators or presidents. So concentrating there can be a very good thing because you know it's not that huge of a group of people. And just even with the struggles that are so necessary against gentrification-based uh, re, you know, redistricting, the redistricting has been hugely problematic, but it can also be fought. Redistricting isn't permanent and it's not uh, it's not something that we're hopeless against. We, we have options around that, and there's, there's lawsuits going on, there's mobilizations going on. The origins of the Poor People's Campaign have a lot to do with Reverend Barber's work against the redistricting efforts in North Carolina when he was the head of the state uh, NAACP some years back. So there's, there's a lot of options around that. On the question of the, uh, the polio campaign in, uh, in Afghanistan, this is one of the travesties of the impact of the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan and the occupation, uh, the, there was some effort to support UN teams that were trying to do inoculations, vac vaccinations, because Afghanistan was one of only two countries, the other being Pakistan, where polio had made a, a recurrence uh, 20 years ago. The problem became the U.S. was using health teams to get information, including the information that led to confirmation about the location of Osama bin Laden and led to his assassination. And the outrage towards that has led to massive opposition in certain areas of both Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, towards health teams, where parents don't allow their children to be vaccinated because they're afraid that it will be the same thing, that they will take their DNA, which is exactly what the US did. It used a local, doctor, a local Pakistani doctor, to show up at the house, knock on the door, and say, we'd like to vaccinate all the children in the compound. They said, oh, OK. And they, through that, they managed to confirm the location of bin Laden and you know the consequences of that. And people in those countries know the consequences. So that intersection of humanitarian and military goals is a very, very dangerous one. I'll tell you one story. In, on the one occasion of my life, first and as far as I can tell, will probably be the last, that I went to the Pentagon to meet with some uh, policy makers, colonels mainly, I think. They were like mid-level policy people. This was in the first months of the Obama administration when there was actually a debate underway about whether or not to expand the US military role in Afghanistan. Um, we made a several, uh, there were four or five of us, and we made a set of presentations on different aspects of the war in Afghanistan and why it was so problematic and why it should be ended and all of that. And the only thing they wanted to actually engage with, and, and we ended up spending two and a half hours in what was supposed to be about a 45 minute meeting, was on the question of why we thought they could not get more parts of the humanitarian assistance world to come in under their tent. We want to help. We want to you know, help all the humanitarian groups. We don't understand why they won't, you know, we could help them. Why won't they work with us? And I looked at the guy like, you know, really, seriously? And I said, okay, I have no idea if you're trying to pull my chain on this or not, but I'm gonna take you seriously for the moment. If you were seriously asking that question, the answer is because you, like every other military in the world, your job is to kill people and break things. That's the job of the military. The job of humanitarian aid workers is to pick up the pieces afterwards. So why in the world do you think they would wanna work with you? And he said, well, how are we supposed to do our work? And I said, you're supposed to do your work not by doing your work. You're supposed to get out of the way so humanitarian work can actually make people's lives better. So it, it went on and became quite interesting in some other ways. But it was that sort of lack of understanding where they speak of humanitarian aid workers as force multipliers. Because they see it as that's part of the winning hearts and minds goals of wars against terrorism. It's part of the reason why you can't have military solutions to terrorism. It doesn't work. We've heard that from every president, including George Bush, when he launched it. And yet, 
what we hear is, there is no military solution, so I'm gonna send 17,000 new troops until we figure out what to do. It's like, oh, well, that's very smart. But that's what we're faced with. That's what we're needing to challenge. So I'm probably one of the few people in the room that spent six years in combination of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. I uh, worked with the SDF politically for a while. Okay. But one of the things is clear is that the number one national threat is climate change. Is there any, anything on the horizon, any uh, leaders on the military side of things who are coming forward with um, you know, a better thought process I work a lot with the, with the Dutch and the Australians. The Europeans see it differently. They, they work with it differently. Of, you know, we can, if we can work on this problem, we won't need as many of the other military things. You know, that is the, you know, long range solution thinking uh, outside the box. Is there anything Absolutely. Going on? Very important question, and I appreciate you asking it. Your, your experience there probably showed you some of the environmental impact of those wars. The, the young soldiers that I know that I work with in, in groups like About Face, Iraq Veterans Against the War, <clears throat> talk about the burn pits as this generation's Agent Orange. Um, I mean, I think there is, I know there is discussion underway at the highest levels of the Pentagon. Unfortunately, I think it's not enough outside the box. So for example, the Navy is kind of, the, they're the ones that are leading, and the Navy is saying stuff like in, I forget their time frame, it's like in 10 years maybe, we're gonna have 50% of all of our facilities, our ships, our submarines, everything, uh, using, um, using uh, not fossil fuels, right? Well, if you look at that sentence, wasn't very coherent, but you know what I'm saying. If you look at that sentence alone, that sounds good, right? The problem is, number one, they're including nuclear as not fossil fuels, when nuclear fuel, of course, is dangerous for a whole other set of reasons. But beyond that, what they're not doing is challenging the role of the Navy. So they're not saying we should, you know, the, the Navy right now has 12 aircraft carriers. That's more than half the aircraft carriers that exist in the world. No other country has more than two. And those two, one is Italy and the other is the UK, both of them only have one that's operative and the other is like, whatever, being fixed or upgraded or something. But it, it's like crazy how many aircraft carriers we have relative to the rest of the world. It's only, it only makes sense, in a perverse kind of way, if you accept as sensible that our role in this country is to sail the seven seas and be in charge of everybody else. Then maybe you need seven aircraft carriers. Why you need 12 is a whole other question. You don't, but you know. What the, what the Navy is talking about is not cutting back how many aircraft carriers we have or not having submarines with nuclear weapons on hair triggers. They're not talking about being less militaristic they're talking about killing people and breaking things without using so much fossil fuels. So that, to me, is very problematic. Partly because it's a distraction from the goal of stopping the Navy's use of fossil fuels by stopping what the Navy's doing to people around the world and providing new jobs for people in the Navy as they rotate out. I don't think anybody's calling for people being forced out of the military, but more having jobs that are real jobs that are available for people as they transition out of the military. So that's, I think, a huge part of it. The other part of it is that the recognition that climate change is a huge security threat, a huge threat to all of us, isn't grounded on the sense of the impact of climate change on human life, all human life. It's grounded on what's it gonna mean for our borders? How do we, how do we make stronger borders that can keep back a wave of immigrants coming because they're forced by rising seas to abandon all the islands in the Caribbean, for just as one possibility. 
they're looking at that. They're not looking at what can we do to prevent that from happening. It's what can we do to stop those people from engulfing us. So it, it's this very xenophobic approach as well. So, you know, the one good thing about like what that stuff the Navy's doing, the one thing that happens with the US military is because it's so big, everything that they do ripples out into society. So if the Navy decided to use solar panels on every naval base, the price of solar panels would go way down. And you'd need a lot more people having jobs producing solar panels. That would all be good. But the other part, not so good. So it's kind of a mixed bag. Oh, what thoughts do you have about um, uh, Kashmir? Could the US get pulled into a conflict there? And the other location would be maybe the Eighth Sea, the Arctic Sea. Uh, China has recently found itself on a Nordic panel. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of contention between Canada, US, China now. Yeah, I, I'm no expert on the on the Arctic stuff. Um, I know it's a nightmare, and I know that the the global approach of militarizing the Arctic is the wrong approach. What the right approach is, I, I don't know enough to have an idea. Of, I mean, other than that it should be diplomacy, not war. But that's my mantra for pretty much everything. Um, what that would look like, I, I don't really know. I mean, I know that it's a huge problem that the the two or three countries with the biggest and strongest militarized technology are the ones who will emerge as the, uh, the, the, the powers in the Arctic, and that's a disaster. How to prevent that, I don't know. This is why we need an entirely new kind of United Nations. I mean, my other work is on, on the United Nations and its both potential and how the US is undermining it. But if there were a People's United Nations that included essentially a, a parliamentary component to the UN, that might be a, a venue for taking up questions like that, questions like what should happen to the Arctic and how do we protect it. The question of Kashmir, I mean, this is, it's such a dangerous flashpoint. As we all know, we're, we're dealing with two nuclear armed countries that have fought four wars already. The people of Kashmir, of course, are the ones that are paying the biggest price. But the threat is much bigger than the Kashmiris. And I, I don't know what the, what the likelihood there is. It's, I hope that we don't see US intervention in anything remotely resembling a military version, because that would just add more fuel to a very, very hot fire. Um, whether multilateral organizations like the United Nations are in any position to, to help negotiate away from this flashpoint, I don't know, but I'm not, I mean, right now things to be kind of stalled. Um, there, there were some negotiations underway and then they pulled back, but the, the Indian government seems to be loosening the stranglehold on the Kashmiris a little bit. They, they opened up the uh, cell phone networks, I, I guess about a week ago, and as far as I know, they're still operating. But I, I don't know, again, I, this is a really complicated one and I'm, I just don't have enough information to know exactly how that's gonna play out. But I would say it is one that we need to be watching very, very carefully because it's, it's not a flashpoint that's usually in our consciousness in this country because the US is not at the center of it. But its impact will be global if it gets worse. So it's a very severe threat. 